Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 919, The Ruins of Odin Castle. And wow, wow, all right, we have a pretty ridiculous chapter on our hands this week. So much so that I really do need to skip straight to the end because there are only two words currently on anybody's mind and those two words are time and travel. This sort of revelation was unexpected to say the least, not by everyone, but certainly by me. I spent a great deal of time last week investing more into the ghost theory, which by the way was dealt with hilariously during the chapter by setting all of the spooky atmosphere up and paying it off as a Kinemon diarrhea joke. And speaking of, Zoro mysteriously disappeared upon reaching the ruins of the Odin castle, so what's the bet that he also has a bout of diarrhea, just like Kinemon and Beppo? I mean, everyone's got it. But we have more important matters at hand right now than excrement, because we have potentially world-shattering revelations to deal with. The idea of time travel in One Piece is a pretty terrifying thing, because even in the best case scenarios, it usually creates a whole mess of problems and plot holes. But what I will say is that most of those things result when a story involves traveling backwards in time. Like for example, Trunks traveling to the past in Dragon Ball Z. Like one little introduction of time travel and all of a sudden the world is split up into at least three alternate timelines. The story was still well executed in my opinion, but time travel and the consequences thereof took center stage, as it always does. Another example is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. I won't spoil it here of course, but to me the play becomes more of a time travel story rather than a Harry Potter story, which is a huge danger of time travel. At the moment One Piece is starting out strong because all we know of is time travel into the future. This is brilliant because this direction of travel doesn't bring up the logistical issues of actions in the past changing the future, it's also just much more realistic in general. I mean if that word can be used to describe time travel. But really, in theory, we can already travel into the future by placing people in stasis to awaken at a further date. Being One Piece though, I think we'll be going down the route of a more supernatural element. And from the hits in this chapter, it looks an awful lot like it was Odin's wife who was able to enact the travel of Momonosuke and company, which has been remembered as a curse. A very interesting curse, by the way, which speaks of nine shadows woven together through 20 years of Moonlight Nights. Which is very intriguing because this chapter also revealed that there are more graves present than we saw in Nine. 18. A lot of them are obscured stones, but after closer inspection it looks like there are 11 graves, and one of them even has a little ceremonial roof that the rest of the Kozuki clan members have. That's pretty surprising to me because it may mean that Momonosuke has a sibling, like a little sister. Maybe her name's Tama for example. Probably not. But I find the presence of a fourth Kozuki a very interesting possibility, and a classic One Piece story turn like how Rebecca turned out to be a princess. But if my basic maths is correct, 11 minus 2 equals 9. The exact amount of individuals prophesized or whatever by Odin's wife. I take away 2 from that 11 because I'm assuming that both Odin and his wife are actually dead, leaving our 9 time travelers, of which Kiku is one of them by the way, that was pretty unexpected. Although I guess her connection to Kinemon was hinted at by just how tall she is. But Kinemon, Kanjuro, Raizo, Kiku and Momon Monosuke make a mighty five, which you may have noticed is a smaller number than nine. So it looks like we do still have a few more samurai to collect, one of which may or may not be a Kozuki clan member. And the more I think about it, the more Tama doesn't sound like such a bad theory after all. I mean, we know absolutely nothing about her parents. However, she has lived through at least the last three to four years as she encountered Ace at a much younger age. So uh, uh, probably not. I mean, unless the samurai have been floating around the world for three to four years now as well. I was also hoping that Hitetsu could be one of them, but he can be canceled out for the same reason that Tama would be. And it looks like Shutenmaru is nobody. The chapter all but blatantly states that Law was Shutenmaru acting under an alias, which I guess is nice because we don't have this random hanging character anymore. We do have a new character introduced during this chapter to compensate though, Kyoshiro, who has magnificent Kuwabara style hair, and a nice little comic quirk where he just fell asleep at a critical moment. The hair is a very interesting choice though because it's such a symbol of rebellion, so it's a bit odd to see it being sported by someone serving under the current power structure. Although I guess he is a bit of a rebel, very keenly talking about forbidden topics, so yeah, maybe he'll become an ally. I don't think he's one of the Nine Shadows though, and I'm hoping he turns out to be a pretty strong antagonist actually, because currently in the absence of Kaido and Jack, we certainly need someone, Although during this chapter we also got some hints that Shogun Orochi is a fighter himself, specifically a dual sword wielder. So at the moment I picture him very much like Shiki prior to him uh, cutting off his legs. So yeah, I'm really hoping that Orochi is less of a Spandam type figure and more of an actual threat because he might be a nice opponent for one of the Nine Shadows. Because at this stage I don't see why he would be left to the Straw Hats to deal with because their conflict seems to be geared more towards the Beast Pirates. And while we're here, I just want to touch on that random teacher in the Wano propaganda class. This is probably going to get buried amongst all the other talk about this chapter, but she appears to be a Devil Fruit user, which looks to be the third Snake Zoan type we've seen, although I guess she might be a Smile user. But I'm leaning away from that because she isn't or at least doesn't appear to be a member of the Beast Pirates. And I don't see Kaido giving away these fruits that he was so desperately pressuring Dolphin Mingo to create. In any case, her power combined with her typically beautiful design says to me that she will be somewhat important in future events. 
but we are still not done with time travel. One of the best things about this chapter is being able to look back on the events of Punk Hazard, Dress Rosa and Zoe, and viewing all of these random samurai moments in a new light. For example, a user on the Arlong Park forum has pointed out a part of chapter 817 where Kinemon was saying that he was pleasantly surprised to see that Inuarashi and Ekomamushi were still alive. And they replied that they knew if they kept those words from that day in mind that they knew their paths would cross again. And that interaction was just a complete write-off when the chapter came out. But looking back on it with this whole time travel business in mind is just really cool. And there's probably a whole lot of other gems like that out there in the post-Fishman Island era of the series. But the last piece of time travel related shenaniganry I want to mention is bringing up the folk tale of Urashima Taro once again. I mentioned it previously when the sumo wrestler Urashima was introduced, but this story has been a huge influence on a lot of different aspects of One Piece and it may continue because it even has a time travel aspect to it. In the tale, Urashima Taro spends five days in the Ryugu Kingdom being entertained by Princess Otohime. However, when he returns home, he finds that 300 years have passed. Furthermore, he then opens a box, a Tamatebako box to be precise, which he was given and told not to open. Very, very naughty. And as a result, he instantly becomes an old man, presumably aging about 300 years in an instant. Sad story, really, one that gets used to teach young children not to be disobedient, but I can see it coming into play here. Perhaps after Wano is liberated and the quote-unquote curse, or devil fruit power is released, then everybody will age rapidly, turning Momonosuke into a 28-year-old man, aka someone who may actually be old enough to become the Shogun of Wano. Other than that, this chapter had some really nice comedy going for it. Law had a great moment where all the villagers were farewelling Luffy with this absolute disgusted look on his face at the mere thought of a benevolent pirate. But the part I found most hilarious was when Luffy first saw the graves of Kinemon and everyone and instantly jumped to the conclusion that they could have died because hey, Luffy hasn't spoken to them in a while. It's a wonderful moment of completely oblivious comedy from Luffy and I very much appreciate in general how humor helped to balance out this chapter. I suspect that in any other story, this just would have been a big info dump or a super serious gaze into the situation of Wano. And those sorts of things, while amazing and necessary to service the meta narrative, run the risk of not really making the journey itself enjoyable for the readers. But I enjoyed every panel of this chapter, like when we were just hanging out with Speed and Tama, or even when we were looking into a typical school day of the students of Wano, because it was just plain fun. But that pretty much does it for chapter 919. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to like, favorite, or subscribe. And if you are in any way inclined to support this independent channel, then please do check out my Patreon, Discord server, or Twitter, the links to which are in the handy description below. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.